Good afternoon. Welcome to the Dr. Kennedy Podcast. Dr. Kennedy Podcast is sponsored by the Daniels Foundation for Impact and Development. That's the Daniels Foundation for Impact and Development. And guess what, folks? Today we have another great guest. We have Terry O'Connor. Terry O'Connor, the former basketball coach at Fairfield University, uh, philanthropist, worked at the Sheehy Center, also was uh, the coach at Harvard University for a while back. Uh, Terry is a great mind, came from a great pedigree, and we're going to pick his mind just on a lot of different topics, particularly uh, race relations, particularly in terms of the whole idea of what is philanthropy, why you give, and how he was so successful at the Sheehy Center. And uh, I apologize for being on the road here for a little bit, but uh, here's a little bit different look. And, um, you know, we'll get to Terry kind of on the other side. Again, please support the Daniels Foundation at daniels-foundation.org. That's daniels-foundation.org. And we've been having a lot of good interviews. I hope you guys are appreciating the series and things that we've been trying to accomplish. So sit back, relax, get a cold beverage, and we'll have Terry O'Connor on the other side. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, and welcome to the Dr. Kennedy Podcast. Dr. Kennedy Podcast is, not, is supported by the Daniels Foundation for Impact and Development. That's the Daniels Foundation for Impact and Development. And guess what, folks? This afternoon, we have Terry O'Connor, past coach at Fairfield, but I think more important, importantly, the community guy has done a lot of great things in Bridgeport at the Sheehy Center. I don't know if Terry agree, but I think some of your greatest work has been at the Sheehy Center. And Terry, why don't you say hello to the audience and uh, what you've been up to lately? Well, Kenny, it's great to see you. You still look pretty young. That maybe you could still suit up and, and play. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if you can car, guard John Bagley as well as you did uh, back in 1981 when we played BC. But you know, you never know. Never know. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I've been. Um, I actually retired. You mentioned the Sheehan and I retired. Actually, it's two years ago this month, December of 2018, okay. and I started my own consulting, TJO Consulting, to work with you know nonprofits. And I was having a great time uh, all of 19 and right on up until March of this year when the pandemic hit. And I had seven clients. I had finished the work with six of them. And I was the last thing I had to do with my seventh and I've been working with them for about five months was to run their golf tournament, help them run their golf tournament in May, which got postponed anyway. Right. So I, we ended that relationship because there was really nothing left. And I got a phone call from a former Sheehan Center board member saying, how would you like to be the interim executive director at the Discovery Museum, which is located in Bridgeport, which is a great science you know, museum, been in existence since the early 60s. And I thought it was going to be a couple of months. And I'm actually ending my job as interim uh, December 31st. So it's interesting. Two, two years ago, I ended one career, and now I'm ending the museum in December of uh, 2020. Fantastic. It sounds like you're you're active. And um, as I was mentioning before we came on, I hope you um support me as um as you are, you know, active in my elder years and doing stuff because I think it keep, helps keep the mind fresh, you know. Yeah. So let's jump into some of the um the questions. Um, you know, first of all, thank you for agreeing to do the interview. I know it's busy around the holidays and things are going on, so I, I appreciate that. And you know, the, the basic idea is to give people an idea of, you know, we're all kind of products of the you know, maybe your case, 50s, 60s, 70s, the early time period. And now we move forward into this new era. And can we use some of our past history to get some insight into what's going on today? And so, you know, um, can you talk a little about your, your background, your formal education, and some of the things that influenced you growing up, your formative years? Sure, sure. Well, my formal education, uh, obviously high school, I went to Our Lady of Lords High School, Poughkeepsie, New York. Mm -hmm. And I'll talk about influences there. And then I went to Niagara University, I was fortunate. I was a year ahead of Calvin Murphy, who uh, to this day, I still know. I, I talked to Calvin yeah. and uh, obviously he could play a little. Yeah. And uh, then I got my master's at Syracuse. Okay. And uh, when I graduated, Vietnam was in, it was the height of Vietnam, 1969. And so I was deferred because I was going into teaching. So I started teaching at Bishop Grimes High School, East Syracuse, New York. I was a freshman coach. Then I was a JV coach my next year. And then I left, I was fortunate to get a head coaching job at Phoenix, New York, just north of Syracuse. <clears throat> so I coached there for a year. And again, Kenny, when we talk about uh, opportune times, we had a very good team. We wound up going 20 and one. 
And the first game in the section three playoff, we were playing, I don't even remember now who, but in the uh, second game, the athletic director at Auburn Community College, his son was playing in the second game. So he was there early and he watched my team play. And a month after the sectional ended, the job at Auburn Community College as a head basketball coach opened. I applied and a gentleman's name, Chuck Stavesky, obviously saw my team play, was impressed. I interviewed, I got the job. And I was fortunate too, because as I was teaching, I started working on my master's. So I, I took me two years part-time to get my master's. So in August of 71, I finished my master's and I'm appointed the head basketball coach at Auburn Community College. Wow. So again, right place at the right time. Well, that's interesting. I, I just started to get reintroduced to um, upstate New York, the Finger Lakes, and uh, it's a beautiful area, Gypsy. Um, you talk about, you know, Hudson Valley, you know, I don't like think people know the beauty of Hudson Valley. And, you know, okay. what did that do in terms of your, your mindset as a kid? Uh, I love growing up in High Park. Uh, my mom and dad were involved with uh, CYO. They helped start the CYO activities in our parish, Regina Chaley. And my dad was involved with the Boy Scouts. We used to have paper drives. And I was a Boy Scout. I was a Life Scout. I was an Order of the Arrow and um, really enjoyed Boy Scouts. My high school coach, again, more coincidence of things that happened, was a gentleman by the name of Ed Donahue. And so uh, he was there until my end of my sophomore year. And then he became the freshman coach at Niagara with the head coach, Jim Maloney. And they're the ones that recruited Calvin to Niagara. So I decided to go to Niagara. I wind up playing on the freshman team. And Ed was really one of my role models. He was a history teacher at Lourdes. Uh, he taught us history um, and physical education. And he was a football, baseball. He was the first coach at, at Lourdes High School. So he coached football, baseball, and basketball. Mm -hmm. And then when he left, unfortunately, the gentleman who replaced him for basketball um, was not very good. They lasted two years and he was fired. So I learned things from him as well, things not to do as a coach. So from Coach Donio, I learned positive things. And from Coach Hughes, I learned some negative things not to include in, in my coaching repertoire. And then I was fortunate to go to Niagara and Taps Gallagher who was the coach at Niagara, who was a legend back in those days, won 500 game, was very close with uh, Joe Lapchick who coached at St. John's and Karnaseka. And Lapchick or, or Gallagher helped me get into coaching because he introduced me to a bunch of coaches and I started working basketball camps. And that was one of the ways you got into the coaching profession by working camps in the summer, getting paid $68 for a week's work, <laughs> living in a cabin. Yeah. Well, now, so now talk to me about you as a, as a basketball player now. Did you recruit and play it, Mark Niagara? Niagara? I only played on a freshman team. I was not a great player, but I was a great student of the game. Okay. So when, when Jim Maloney left, um, Frank Layden came in and his two assistants, uh, Dick Conover and Joe DiGregorio, I became friends with them. And I went to Coach Layden and said, listen, I want to coach. Would you allow me to come to practices and sit in and watch? And, and Frank said, absolutely. And so when I graduated from Niagara and, and went to Syracuse to start coaching, I went back and worked Frank's camp as well. And then Calvin actually came to speak at our camp the year he graduated, he graduated in May of 70. And that summer he came to Syracuse and spoke in my camp. Oh, that's an interesting choice. Now, is that the Frank Layden of the Utah Jazz Frank Layden? That's Right, well, Frank, after he, Frank coached maybe eight or nine years, I'm trying to remember how many years at Niagara and got, he got the New Orleans Jazz job. And then they moved to Utah, whatever, five years, seven years later. And uh, he became the coach out there and then eventually the president. Right, well, you got some great, Great role models, great. And hey, you a lucky guy. <laughs> you, I, I, I will not just, dis, I won't dispute that with you at all. Which, uh, I think that's, that's great. Frank Layden, and then you mentioned a little earlier, Digger Phelps. Okay, um, now you mentioned your, your mom and pops, uh, how they impact. Can you talk about your family impact, your formative years, and you know what portion or person or person were important in your life growing up? Well, my dad probably was the most important because uh, I was one of six kids and we never had a ton of money. Um, but uh, he worked uh, his regular job at IBM and then he also worked some part-time. He worked his overtime there as much as he could, but he always made himself available, whether it was a swimming meet. I also swam in the summers. So whether swimming meets, or again, as I mentioned, paper drives with the Boy Scouts. Mm -hmm. 
pick me up when I had to work part time. I worked at the Grand Union. He'd pick me up at 8, 830 at night on a Friday night, bring me clothes to change into, take me down to Lourdes for a dance that night. Uh, he was always available to us uh, as a dad. And so I look back at him. He was certainly a role model on on caring about your family, being involved with the community, giving back. Right. You know, as, you, as you're talking, you, you paint a picture for me of, you know, I'm thinking Poughkeepsie in his heyday, uh, West Point in his heyday. You know, it must have been a very great time to, was, those were vibrant cities back then. Poughkeepsie was, you know, now maybe a little on, on his own, um, seen better days. Can you talk a little about Poughkeepsie, you know, why you think it's, you know, what it was like that, you know, downtown Poughkeepsie, the community itself, and uh, what, do you, what do you see as maybe some, some things coming back with opportunities? Yeah. Well, again, when I was growing up, there was a time when, you know, we didn't have keys. You didn't lock your car. You didn't lock your house. Right. Um, you, your parents kind of had an idea where you might be. We'd be somewhere playing basketball or maybe we'd be playing football. Mm -hmm. And if you wanted to eat, you had to be home at six o'clock. Right. But your parents weren't concerned as they are today and as I was with our two boys growing up. Mm -hmm. So that whole era has changed, unfortunately. Right. In terms of the city of Poughkeepsie, it was a vibrant city back then. But you have to remember, IBM came in. So my dad worked for the railroad, New York Central Railroad, and I grew up, I was born in Mount Vernon. And then we moved to Poughkeepsie when he got the job at IBM. We were only in Poughkeepsie for a year. And then we moved into High Park. But Poughkeepsie, the downtown Poughkeepsie had all kinds of stores. Oh, that's a funny story. I'll never forget when I graduated and came home and I got my first credit card and I went into M. Schwartz, which is a men's clothing store. And I bought a black cashmere top coat. I thought I had arrived. Right. I was there, you know, king of the hill. <laughs> and uh, But downtown Poughkeepsie was vibrant with department stores and restaurants. And, mm -hmm. and then it went through as a lot of cities did, the years of decay. Um, and uh, they have come back. Uh, my, my, uh, one of my brothers used to work for Hudson River Housing. He now works for uh, Ulster uh, Housing. Uh, authority and um, they've done a lot of revitalizing of Poughkeepsie and Kingston and the whole Hudson Valley area. Beacon, New York, there are many, many businesses now that have started in Beacon. Uh, business people and entrepreneurs out of New York have come into the Beacon, New York area and revitalized Beacon, which had really fallen on hard time. Right. So I think you're seeing a lot more of people leaving some of the bigger cities like in New York mm -hmm. and moving out where they can still get into New York hour on a train, hour and 15 minutes on the train. We've seen that here in Connecticut with the housing boom because of the pandemic. People selling houses here for 10, 20,000 over asking price, never even meeting the people. They saw the house on a Zoom, mm -hmm. made an offer and bought the house. Yeah, we see that in Jersey too, kind of this, uh, this New York migration. So let's uh let's build on that. So you kind of mentioned you bought this uh this coat. So you're a very charismatic guy. I kind of know that. Yeah, a couple, <laughs> good, a couple of good motivational speeches. <laughs> and uh, so you know what kind of um you know what kind of classmate were you? Did you get along with friends? Were you popular, quiet thing? I know the answer, but you know yeah. how you know how did you kind of go through dating that kind of stuff? Yeah, I think I was um. Uh... You know, it was popular. I mean, I, I wasn't the class president, but I, I ran track. I played football. Uh, I played basketball for my sophomore year. I was involved. I was on student council one or two years. I forget now. Um, and we had a circle of friends that we hung out with. Um, and I, I certainly enjoyed the, the four years at Lourdes. I learned the positives and negatives. I got a good education uh, from Lourdes. Um, I had some very, very good teachers. And so uh, uh, it, was, it was the same kind of situation at Niagara. Uh, my college roommates, I'm still close with them. Um, we actually do a Zoom every six weeks or so with the class of 1969 for Niagara. And, and one of our classmates who actually went to Lourdes with me and Niagara has also started one with graduates from Our Lady of Lourdes. And we do a Zoom every six, seven weeks. Um, so it's interesting to see where people are. Uh, you know, 50 years later for uh, college and uh, a little longer than that for high school. Yeah, interesting. Okay, let's jump into the, the meats and potatoes here. So uh, you've had this fantastic coaching career. You kind of mentioned, you know, junior college, high school. You've kind of seen it all. You've seen junior, you've seen uh, high school, junior college, college, professional sports. 
So looking back, I mean, talk a little about your coaching career, what you think are some of the highlights, some of the lowlights, and now that you have some, you know, retrospect, what do you kind of glean into that in terms of could have, should have, would have, or anything along those lines? So uh, I guess if I look at the highlights is getting the job at, at Bishop Grimes to start my career. And I was a freshman coach, as I mentioned, my first year. And uh, we finished six and six. And um, it was very interesting because uh, it was the beginning of my relationship with African-American athletes. Because in high school at Lourdes, we didn't have uh, African-American athletes. I'm, I'm trying to think if we had any going back. And I don't think we did. At Niagara, obviously, I interacted because I became friends with Calvin and some of the other guys, Eddie Street and, and so forth. Um, but now I was coaching African-American athletes for the very first time. Mm -hmm. And um, and I'll get into that as we go further. And then my second year at Grimes, I was a JV coach and we went 10 and eight. And um, I kept learning. I had a great varsity coach by the name of Jim Martin. He was another great mentor. We had a lot of fun uh, there uh, working together. And then I went to um, Phoenix, New York, which is a little, little tiny town north of, uh, of uh, Syracuse and um, all white athletes, you know, no African-Americans there, kind of a farming community and so forth. Mm -hmm. And then I was fortunate to get the job at Auburn Community College and I started recruiting across the board. Right. If you're a good player, I wanted you. White player, African-American player. And I wound up having African-American players stay in our house. Um, we had a first team All-American by the name of Ronnie Bell from Hudson, New York, who went on to Virginia Tech. Here's a good one, you'd appreciate this. His final four choices of school, scholarship offers from Michigan State, Boston College, St. John, and Virginia Tech. And one of the things that I struck when I, when I walked to your office was that picture on your desk. That yes. That, that was him. And I said, oh, that's interesting, you know? So there was a connection there. I, I appreciate the picture. So I, I'm sure that's the guy you're talking about. Yeah. And then uh, again, you know, I, go, I go to Harvard and um, I had two regrets when I look at coaching. One was my fir first year at Harvard and one was my first year at Fairfield. And I'll talk about both. Mm -hmm. We had a gentleman by the name of Brian Banks, 6'9", African-American out of Chicago. And he could really play. I mean, he just, he had all the tools, but uh, I'm not sure he worked as hard at, as his game as he did at other things. I'll never forget one day, he stopped in the office early in the morning and said, coach, I can't be at practice today. And, you know, I was obviously you say, well, how come Brian, what's going on? He says, well, I have the opportunity to have coffee with Andrew Young. Now, Andrew Young at the time was a UN ambassador, you know, and I said, what time is he speaking? And he said, at, at whatever, you know, 2.30. I said, well, hell, we all should go and listen to Andrew Young. We can practice tomorrow or practice later. Um, but I really had a great relationship with Brian and I just wish we had had him maybe two years because I think he could have been an NBA player for sure. We played the University of Detroit and at Cobo Arena, Dick Vitale was the AD then. He had just gotten bumped upstairs. They had three, NL, uh, three NBA first rounders, uh, Tyler, Durod, and Long. All three of them played in the NBA. Right. We're up by seven at the half because Brian's kicking butt on all of them. Wow. And we wind up losing the game by six maybe uh, but we shouldn't have been technically in one sense in the game, but that's how good a player Brian was. Um, and then, um, you know, I come to Fairfield and I only have you, as you mentioned, for the one year. And I wish that we had had you if you had been a junior, because when I think about what happened that next year, unfortunately, they threw Hank Foster out of school. Right. But Hank was a first team all Mac player. Peter was a first team all Mac player. And Jerry Johnson was close to that. So our front line would have been 6'6, six, 6'10, six, six, and, and about 6'4. Right. And then you in the backcourt. And then Bobby Hurt, we had recruited. And O'Toole, we had recruited. And Eddie Gold, and all those guys. Um, because you were, you were such an intelligent player. And again, the best case of that was our Boston College game where. You know, we played the box in one and you held Bagley scoreless. And I can remember, and I'm sure you remember, I never had you even come to the huddles during timeout. You used to stand at half court and stare at the BC huddle. Yeah. You never even came out to us. And, um, you know, we lost that game in double overtime. Um, well, so there are plenty of... Thinking back, sorry, Jim, but that season, people don't realize a point here, point there, could have gone oh. a long way in terms of being, uh, you know, over 500 and maybe, you know, maybe a tournament. You know? Well, we lose to Iona in five overtimes. 
Yeah. We lose to BC in double overtime. We lose to UConn. Remember, we were, we were coming back. We were at a 3-1-1, full court zone press, and we turned them over. Turn, we lost by two. By two, yeah. UConn. So there's three games right there, and I think we wound up, what, 13 wins, 14? I think we were 13 and 15. So that makes you 16 and 12. Yeah. And, you know, who knows? And maybe if we'd won a couple of those games, we might have won another game in between. Oh, yeah. You win 16, 17 games, it changes things. Oh, so many close games. frustrating. But, you know, hindsight's 2020. Well, let's, let's – uh, you know, you mentioned this whole um, – the black athlete. I'm glad you mentioned that because, you know, we kind of go through a renaissance or, you know, um, today we kind of take for granted in the recruitment of black life. I had Kim Mack on. I don't know if you saw his interview. He talked about he was one of the first players at Florida State to actually be recruited and graduate. And that there was this whole, you know, SEC, there was an issue of black athletes in the SEC. So, and you kind of, you cut your teeth at every level. As you kind of see this transformation, what do you think is the takeaway in terms of um, what that means for race relations, per se? You know, yeah. are, we, are, we, are we head back? You know, because there's a couple, a couple ways you can look at that, that you only like black athletes for sports, nothing else. That's what people are saying to me. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah, I think we take one step forward and two back in a sense. But let's I'll give you a perfect example of my feeling about education and athletes. Uh, you had graduated, obviously, and gone. So Bobby Hurt, I kept him out one year and had him tutored because the university wanted to dismiss him. Right. And I didn't, I didn't recruit Bobby. Bobby was there. Yeah. So he wasn't one of my recruits, so to speak, you know, quote, my recruit. Yeah. And, um, but I love Bobby. He was just, um, you know, I used to call him Hurt Me. You know, and Bobby Hurt, Hurt was his last name. Yeah. And I'd always kid him. I said, don't hurt me and missing that shot or whatever. And, uh, but his, he struggled academically because it, they didn't have a, a system in place really to help. Mm -hmm. So we held him out for a year, he didn't play. And we had him tutored and Bobby eventually graduated and then sadly died probably, well, it must be eight or 10 years ago now that Bobby, uh, died. I'm trying to remember Kenny, maybe you do, but um, so my feeling has always been, you should be able to do both. Now, that's an athlete who's not going to the NBA. Mm -hmm. Then you have the one and doneers, which I think has hurt everybody in the game. I think it hurts uh, the colleges, the one and doneers, but it's all about the money. Mm -hmm. I mean, when when you were playing, um, and and a year later, Pete DeBishop gets drafted by Seattle, goes out there, plays very very well. At the eleventh hour, they cut him. He winds up going to Italy for a few weeks, comes back and says, "Coach, I don't want to play." And I had, I had been already talking with his agent about some other teams, and but he didn't do it. Now, Pete's been very successful. He's at a pizza place in Cheshire, Connecticut. He supplied the pizza for me for all my camps with Travis Knight and Cliff Robinson, and he's done well, but he could have played. But his money would have been peanuts in comparison to what they get today. So whether you're a white athlete or a black athlete, if you're a one-and-done guy, it's hard to turn down that. And for many black athletes who are coming from – um, backgrounds that uh, monetarily they've struggled, their family has struggled, and that athlete can turn around and get a house for that mom and dad and help with other siblings and so forth. It's hard to turn down that one and done scenario to go to Kentucky, go to Duke, you know, go to uh, some of the other places. Right. And then you look at though, you take a Villanova that has athletes, white and African American, that stay the four years and still go to the NBA. Um, so it's, it's, the money has certainly changed the game, uh, dramatically and where we are today. If you look at what's going on in college football right now, the four teams, you know, you, you're kidding me about my Notre Dame shirt. So Notre Dame Clemson today, Northwestern is Ohio state. And I forget who Alabama's playing today, but if everything goes the way it's supposed to, it'll be Alabama, Notre Dame, Clemson, and Ohio state. And Ohio state's played five games. The, the Big Ten changed the schedule so that they wouldn't have to play a game so they could, they want Ohio State in for the money. So it's a power five conferences want to take over the money. So you've got that going on and you've also got the lawsuits going on with your handsome base to be able to make money now as an athlete on baseball cards or whatever 
Mm -hmm. uh, you've got that whole image lawsuit and the Supreme Court now has said they're going to hear that case. Oh, so, good. so many things have changed, Kenny, over the years. It's a, it, and this is a funny term. When I was in college, Calvin and the athletes at Niagara and other schools got laundry money. That's what it was called. $15 a month laundry money. And it was for the athlete to buy a pizza, to go on a date mm -hmm. and so forth. Right. Now, to me, that that stopped, I don't know how many years ago, because of the handshakes between alumni and the handshake contained a couple hundred dollar bills in it and all that kind of stuff went on for a long time. It probably still goes on. Right. Well, but the athlete to today, go ahead, you go. Well, no, uh, well, let's, you know, you have such a great mind this because you have the, the mindset because you're, you know, you're the TV analyst and you pretty much touch upon this business model. So, you know, you, you know, we have the, the networks, we have the streaming services. And so, you know, uh, where do you see this playing out in terms of the money stream, in terms of what streaming is going to do to the network and what that's going to do to the game? And what is it, what's that going to do to athletes, opportunities for their likeness and digital and so forth? I think it's just going to continue to boom. I mean, think of all the things there are today, uh, Snapchat and Instagram and, of course, Facebook and on and on it goes. You know, people are doing podcasts. Um, so the athlete today is looking at a way to get some of it. Now, here's part of the problem. The NCAA basket, men's basketball championship pays for the championships of women's lacrosse, volleyball, water polo, tennis, you name it. Yeah. So the foot and football is just so mammoth, the amount of money that's on the line for football. And some people think at some point very soon, the five, the big uh, power five conferences will split from the NCAA. The NCAA will have really no control over them. They'll do their own thing. The television deals are what's driving everything. That's why everybody worked so hard during this pandemic to get the NBA, the NFL, the colleges on TV because of the TV contract. They can survive without people in the stands, but they must have the TV contract. So the athletes are saying, wait a minute, now, I have two sides of the coins on athletes getting money. First of all, people don't realize, what's the cost of a college scholarship? 65000 a year to go to school today? Pick that as an average. Some are less, some are more. So if you multiply that by four, that's a few hundred thousand dollars that that, that football player or basketball player is getting. Then they're, they're living in conditions that the normal student is not. They're eating food 24-7. They have all the athletic equipment. They have all the training aids to get them to the next level, to get to the NBA, to get to the NFL. Uh, those are all benefits. Having said that, there are also restrictions. So a college athlete, I'll give you an example. When you were at Fairfield, if I had you guys stay on campus to go to summer school and you had an eight o'clock class on, on June 10th and so forth and a nine and that was it, you were done. You couldn't work and be on scholarship at the same time. That was an NCAA violation. So how are you gonna get, earn any money so that you could go on a date, go buy a pizza, fill your car up with gas right. because that laundry money had long ago disappeared. Right. And so actually I violated that rule all four years. A lot of the guys that stayed on campus had jobs right. because that's how they earn money. So if you take the ability to earn the money away from the athlete, you're encouraging the alumni handshake with money being exchanged. Yeah. So the answer is, okay, let's go back to laundry money. Well, how much is that going to be? $1,500 a month? Okay, see, if you play the football players and the basketball players $1,500 a month, where does the money come to play the tennis players, the lacrosse players, the swimmers? That most colleges in this country don't make money on their athletic program. Oh, the Alabama does. You know, Texas does, but Fairfield doesn't. University of New Haven doesn't. Right. Quinnipiac doesn't. You know, the uh, Seton Hall, I'm sure, doesn't. Right. Uh, so where do you fund that? And so one of the ways is to allow the players to make money off of their likenesses. Mm -hmm. But again, you know, you played, you know, who's going to make that money? The top three players at Duke in terms of basketball? the quarterback for Alabama, maybe the wide receiver from Alabama, if you got a great running back, the, the guards and the tackles and the center, are they gonna have their likenesses 
uh, requested by companies? I, I don't think so. Well, let me uh, let me throw a little haymaker out there and see where you come down on this one. I'm down here in Florida and I'm starting to see that this is trickling down to high school, that the high school students want to use their likeness. Because, you know, football is big in Florida. So so kids, like, he puts his, uh, his digital image up, up in, like, a, a restaurant and says, you know, he's getting paid. So you think that's something we, it's a slippery slope. So you, are you okay with that? I think it's a problem. Um, I think in, in high school, I think that's uh, not a place for that to happen. Mm -hmm. I think at the college level, uh, it's become a necessity. I mean, people look at college athletic, and it's really not college athletic. It's two sports. It's football and men's basketball. Right. The rest of college athletics, it, it's, it's not going to impact the tennis player. Again, unless you have won everything as a junior growing up in a high school and you're the best player in the state and you're number one and maybe, uh, but you're still an amateur. You haven't played in Wimbledon yet. You haven't played in the U.S. Open. Right. So you're probably not going to be requested, the, the, that lightness. I think if you get down to the high school level, I mean, there was a time when they were allowing college coaches to talk to seventh and eighth graders. Yeah. That's ridiculous. Right. And then you wonder why you have college athletes that are so narcissistic. It's all about them. It's because they have been coddled since the seventh grade, the eighth grade, four years of high school. Mm -hmm. And so they act like they are everything. They're the be all and end all. Oh, yeah, it starts early. Uh, I'm down by uh, it's I, IAG or IMG. It's amazing. IMG, sure. It's like, <laughs> uh, you know, I just ride by it. I'm like, this is unbelievable. $80,000 a year. It just, you know, sports back. But some of that's uh, some of that's well intentioned. I shouldn't, I shouldn't wear a blush. So let's uh, let's get a little more specific. You know, you're in Connecticut, and University of Connecticut is uh, a special entity sports wise. They have football. Big East is coming back. So let's tie that into this whole conference thing in terms of you know, football is king as you mentioned. And for a while there, the Big 12 was looking at maybe looking at UConn, Cincinnati, or Houston, something like that. But you had the Longhorn Network. So Texas has their own network, so that cuts out a bunch of the money. So how do you see UConn winning out this, this network game? Well, UConn, football has really been you know, hurting for a number of years. I mean, the, you know, Randy Etzel is back in his second tour of UConn football. Yeah. And his first tour, uh, they went to a bowl game, and that's the, the thing that happened. Then he flew home uh, and went right to Maryland, didn't come home with the team. Yeah. Yeah. And then UConn went to a bunch of coaches since then. Um, the problem is that when the Big, the Big East was always a basketball school uh, a conference, it was never a football conference. Even though Syracuse was in and had football and UConn had football, uh, it was never. It was basketball. You know, Providence, Georgetown, St. John's. And so in Villanova, it, it was basketball. Mm -hmm. And so when they left, when the Big East split and, and Syracuse and went ACC and so forth and all that history, UConn was left in the middle of nowhere. Right. And, and it really, it really hurt them. It hurt them, obviously, in football. It hurt them in men's basketball. Mm -hmm. Women's basketball is a whole different animal. I mean, Gino could be in the worst conference in the world, but he's still going to play Notre Dame and Stanford and South Carolina and the best women's programs in the country. So he never was really affected by it uh, in a negative way. He still recruited the best players in the country. They were still winning national championships. Uh, now UConn, the, the men are back in the big, men, men and women obviously are back in the Big East. That has helped. I think Dan Hurley has done a good job and will continue to do that. I think his recruiting is picking up, especially with going back in the Big East. I think you'll only see that get better year by year. Uh, he certainly can coach. He proved that at Rhode Island. He's got the pedigree with his dad, Bob Hurley. You know Bob Hurley from Jersey and yeah. St. Anthony. So uh, I think men's basketball is going to be on the upright. There are a lot of people in Connecticut think that UConn ought to just drop football or yeah. go back. Football. They used to be in the old Yankee Conference, UMass and, and Rhode Island and UConn. I'm trying to think who else was in there, probably Vermont or whatever. Um, so right now they're playing an independent schedule. We'll see what the next three or four years uh, does. But football, as you know, is very, very expensive. You know, you need 100 players, men's basketball, women's basketball. You need a dozen. Right. That's a whole lot different in terms of uh, and travel, everything that goes with football. Right. You know, you got more people eating, you got more people traveling, you have more equipment and so forth. 
So we'll see what happens with UConn football. So what about Rutgers? Let's, let's, let's spin that over to Rutgers. Now, they went to the Big Ten. And even though that's a, there's, there's probably some educational benefits of Rutgers being associated with Big Ten, I'm sure that's a – but I'm looking at the facilities question of that. Does Jersey have the money to revamp Rutgers – athletics operations to be at a Big Ten level? You think that they'll pony up for that? I think they went for the money. Um, I think that they'll, it's hard to say that they'll ever really be competitive. I mean, when you look, look at the Big Ten, and now Michigan's in trouble, but a year in, year out, Michigan, I mean, Harbor, he may get fired soon. Yeah. But year in, year out, Michigan's one of the top programs in the country. You yeah. got Michigan, Michigan State, Ohio State, Penn State, uh, I mean, Northwestern now. So if you're Rutgers, there's five ahead of you right there. And, and I'm not even remembering some of the other teams in the Big Ten. So where are you? You're eight, nine, eight, I, right. you, you just can't compete. I think when you look at schools, um, could they ever really compete? Look, Pittsburgh, back in the day, football was a big thing. You go back to Pitt, Penn State, Syracuse, Eastern football was big. But yeah. Syracuse really hasn't been real good in football in a long time. I mean, I was there with Ben Schwartzwalter. And, and Zonka and those guys, uh, but that, that ship sailed a long time ago. Pitt, same thing. Penn State, up until the paternal scandal and all that, and then that ended, they had their hard time. They've come back. Mm -hmm. but they've had the history and tradition. Pitt really hasn't been able to come back. So I just think there are certain programs when you look around the country, that they just can't, they can't compete at the level of the league that they're in, whether they don't have the financial resources, they don't have the commitment of the chancellor or the president or the trustees, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it, I think for some places it's hard. I think Rutgers is a very difficult job uh, for football and, and basketball. Right. Yeah. It's going to be interesting to see how Pico, this is pretty much his, his year. He should be ponying it up this year in the big 10. Well, Steve coached with me in the USBL after I left Fairfield, I coached five years in the, United States Basketball League, the Summer Pro League. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we had uh, Butch Graves, we had Earl Curitan, um, uh, what's it, Michael Adams from BC. Yeah, and, and, Steve, yeah, and Steve was one of my assistants for a year. So I've known Steve forever. He used to be on my radio show every year. And he did a tremendous job at Stony Brook. And when he took the job at Rutgers, I thought, wow, I hope they're paying him a lot of money mm -hmm. because there will come a day when they'll fire him. Right. Because I don't think he can compete in the Big Ten in basketball to a level that eventually the alums will say, listen, what happened? When the coach doesn't win, you fire the coach. You don't look at your commitment. You don't look at your facility. You don't look at your budget. You say the coach can't do the job. Right. And uh, Steve Peichel can coach as well as anyone. But eventually losing to Ohio State and Michigan State and so forth, you're in, they're going to say, Let's bring in a new coach and maybe that'll make a difference. Yep. Hey, let's go to your wheelhouse with this philanthropy and the scenes. Sure. You know, we can we spend an hour just on that. You know, a lot of things I want to talk more in basketball, particularly my senior year, but I gotta gotta let it go. I gotta <laughs> let it go. <laughs> Finally gotta let all that go. So, you know, you were in Bridgeport, so you know the struggles of the black community and some possible solutions and the she centers done some outreach. And then you kind of know how to go out here and raise money, professionally raise money. And so how do you decide, you know, you get this money, how to deploy it, the people, the network. Give us your view on how all that works and what can be done to take that to another level in terms of some of these communities like Bridgeport, North, and so forth. Yeah. Well, I think Bridgeport suffered as many uh, places did. Uh, bigger city, again, Bridgeport's the largest city in the state but they lost all of their manufacturing. Uh, so many manufacturing companies that pay taxes. Yeah. And when the tax base evaporates, then people look around and go, okay, who's filling the void of Bridgeport machine? Yeah. And um, all of the places that used to be in Bridgeport uh, that are gone. And so nobody came in. Stanford with its proximity to New York City, many New York companies came and said, let's relocate to Stanford. It's a half hour train ride to Grand Central. So Stanford was able to benefit by location mm -hmm. where Bridgeport, you add that next hour. That's a big difference for people. It's a three hour commute now in and out. 
So that hurt Bridgeport. All of the businesses that left Bridgeport went belly up. Um, Bridgeport Brass Company, that's the Sheehan Center. Uh, that was an armory, the building. Then the Bridgeport Brass Company took it over. And when they went belly up, they gave the building to the Diocese of Bridgeport. That's how the Sheehan Center got that building. And the Brass Company was a big employer in, in, in Bridgeport. So that's the first problem. The tax base evaporates and you can't fill that void. Now you got a problem. Where are people gonna get good paying jobs? How is that then gonna increase their ability to, for housing? And what do people need to live? They need housing and they need food, but they need a job to provide the food and the housing. There's no jobs. So now you've got people on the street, you've got unemployment problems. And now you've got the necessary um, snow plowing and mowing of of public lands and, and maintaining property falls on the city. Well, the city only has a certain tax base. So now the people that do live in Bridgeport are taxed heavily. So it's a double-edged sword. You don't have the business paying taxes. So you're, you're taxing the, you know, the citizens uh, and it's very difficult for them. The other thing that we don't have here and growing up in New York state, we had county government. Connecticut doesn't have county government. New York has, or, or Connecticut has what, 138 or whatever number of little fiefdoms, all the little cities. Right. And so, you know, you have a health department in this town, a health department in the next town, a health department in the next town, all within five miles of each other, yeah. three different buildings. You know, why can't we have one health department that, ma that manages? And you have, you know, people that are responsible, mm -hmm. just like in a business. Business can have lots of subsidiaries. Yeah. Um, but they have managers that handle those things. Mm -hmm. So it's a real issue. So for fundraising, so when I took the job in 1992 at the Sheehan Center, I said, you know, we're not gonna be able to get a lot of help out of Bridgeport businesses. We're gonna get some, and we did. Uh, the bank, People's Bank has been a stall in Bridgeport for forever and ever and ever. Mm -hmm. and, and then some of the other banks have stepped up. Chase Bank was a big player for a long time, not so much anymore. Webster Bank became, as we grew our board at the Sheehan Center, from nine or 10, 11 people to eventually 26 people, we were able to get fingers in a lot of different pies and that helped us raise the money. And then I also realized that between here, meaning Bridgeport and the New York line of a 30 minute drive, you're one of the wealthiest counties in all of the United States. So we have to go there and we have to get some of the wealth to give back to the children of the Bridgeport area. Right. And you know, when we look at the Sheehan Center, yes, a lot of our children came out of Bridgeport, but we ran the high school basketball league in the summer and the fall. We ran leagues for fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. Those youngsters came from all over Fairfield County. So we were not just providing for Bridgeport. We were providing for youngsters from all over the county to come to a place and interact with Asian, white, African-American, Hispanic, you name it. Um, there was an opportunity to interact. Our summer camp had uh, almost 300 youngsters a week for seven, eight weeks in the summertime. Uh, so we had to go out and find individuals and companies that felt that inner city youth, education, that those were important things. Kid, uh, kids at risk and we want to help and we want to support that. And over time, we were able to build that network of companies uh, in the Bridgeport area and throughout the state of Connecticut. We were able to go get some government money. We were able to get bonding money for a number of different projects um, within, the, uh, within the building, put a new roof on the building, renovated the lower level downstairs. Uh, so we were able to do some things with bonding money as well. So it's interesting because this whole, so you kind of hit a, a theme I want to build on this urban core. So my foundation, Emphasis is the urban core because as affinity for African American students, you know, there's some obvious deficiencies there in terms of physical hardware and you look at all the test performances, there's a some type of educational gap. So what is the responsibility for, let's say, let's just pick on institutions because I we know I'm a pick on Fairfield University. <laughs> what is the responsibility of Fairfield? You know, they've been kind of pigeonholed up in Fairfield County. And one of their competitors is uh, Sacred Heart. Seems to be doing a lot more move in that urban core relative to Fairfield. Does Fairfield have responsibility to step up and do more or, or, or do they lose out on the market? Do they just give the market opportunity to Sacred Heart and say, run with it? Yeah, I can't speak to why 
uh, Fairfield, but you're right. You're, it's an accurate statement that Sacred Heart has been intimately involved with the community. Their uh, students uh, volunteer all over the community. They have under the Jackwell School of Business, they have their center for nonprofit and their master's students can, uh, the nonprofits can apply and ask them to do some sort of a project, a feasibility study, whatever that nonprofit need. And then they select uh, a number of nonprofits and the MBA students in, in the Wealth School of Business go out and do that project uh, at no cost to the nonprofit. Mm -hmm. And they have been very helpful over the years to a number of nonprofits. They did, uh, obviously they did one for me at the Sheehan Center, uh, but they continue to do that. They provide uh, workshops in the whole nonprofit area. Uh, so they made a commitment uh, as a Catholic institution uh, to be involved in the community. Um, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving in two weeks at the Discovery Museum. Right next to us is what's called the Discovery Magnet School. Sacred Heart is involved with that school with their STEM program. We've just signed a management agreement with Sacred Heart to be become part of the management team at the Discovery Museum. They want to improve and increase the uh, visibility of the museum, more STEM programs, more education, and so forth. So they really have a vision of being involved throughout the community. And it's not just Bridgeport, it's the surrounding area of the state of, of Connecticut. Um, and so that's a philosophy. That's a trustee to a president coming on down. Um, and, and Fairfield has done things in the community, but not to the extent that uh, Sacred Heart has done. Interesting. So uh, let's, let's, let's build up to this whole Black Lives Matter. It's impacting every part of society. Um, you know, the forefront is police brutality, but assuming that's a minimum standard, where do you see the movement going? What would you like to see happen? How do nonprofits play a role or not play a role? Uh, I think everybody has to play a role. So whether you're a business, you're a nonprofit, uh, I think you have to play a role. Um, you know, one of the things that I'll stick on a nonprofit for a minute, you, you, on your board, you try to have to. Uh, a level um, of, of um, accountability to have whether it's, whether it's uh, minorities, whether it's women, you know, women CEOs, minority CEOs and so forth, uh, that still has to improve. I think you have to have an incoming administration as we do now that understands it and, and does it encourage, the, the, uh, it, it, it does encourage diversity, not uh, discourage it and play games as what's happened in my opinion in the last four years with President Trump. I think that when you look now at President-elect Biden's cabinet that's coming in, he's got everything. He's got women, he's got Hispanics, he's got African-American, he's got um, um, uh, a gay, uh, Pete Buttigieg coming in. He's, he's making this cabinet look like America, right. which I think there has to be a message. I mean, when you look at how many people didn't wear masks in this country because their answer when they were interviewed was, well, the president doesn't wear a mask, so why should I? And the people in North and South Dakota who are now dying at record numbers and had COVID cases because they said, oh no, we don't need to wear a mask. So I think in terms of Black Lives Matter or any movement, it has to start at the top. And you've got a president now who's gonna come in and say, we want diversity. We want people to engage. We want people to get to know each other. And I think for years, frankly, Kenny, I think that a lot of white guys were intimidated by black guys, um, high school age, um, and didn't have an opportunity to get to know. And if you don't know someone, there's that little fear uh, because you don't know them. And when I go look back on all my years of coaching, some of the funniest moments I had were with a lot of the African-American athletes that I coached. Just their sense of humor, uh, you know, call you, call, we used to call you light, we call hurt, hurt me. Um, I mean, just, just the different things. Uh, I used to call Joe, Joe Jackson was a kid that played for me at Auburn Community College out of Sotus, New York. He used to shoot bank shots like Sam Jones. Oh. And we used to call him money in the bank. 
and we he'd come down on the court. We'd run a play, and I, I, I we had a set play called Money, and we ran a play for him to get you know come around a pick screen, whatever, and and shoot it. And we'd call the play Money. And when I look back on it, it, it just uh, we had so much fun with it. And I saw white players for the first time in their lives get to know an African American. You know, back then it was black black kids, white kids. You know. And now it's African-American, but back those days, you were a black kid, I was a white kid. And how do we get to know each other? And how do we walk hand in hand down the street? And how does a white kid go into your home and vice versa and feel comfortable? So without people understanding culture, uh, traditions, uh, it's never gonna change. And the violence has to stop, obviously. There has to be more police training. There has to be more social workers. Uh, that are involved with police. Uh, I was very fortunate in Bridgeport. Uh, we ran a, uh, uh, a basketball league at night and um, it was run out of Baltimore and I'm trying to think of the name of it and I'll come up with it as we talk. But guys had to come for either a nine o'clock or a 10 o'clock workshop and then we played games and we finished around one in the morning. We had health screenings for them um, and so forth. And um, we had police presence and we really got to know, they got to know me. You know, I had a little bit of an advantage because they knew I was a college basketball coach and I was doing TV and radio. So we related and got to know. Um, and so I could walk in certain areas in Bridgeport, even though I was white and guys would come up to me. And if a guy was with me that knew me and somebody else had an attitude, the guy said, don't even start. This guy is fine and you better not bother him. Uh, and I think it's alert. Let me uh, let me inject you a second. My my, I have a little technical difficulty with my battery. I have like uh, three minutes of battery life left. So I, what I like to do is um, I just need to go plug into a, a, a battery. So I'm gonna I'll put something on cord and come right back to you if you don't mind. Is that okay? Okay, that's fine. I'll be right with you. Hold up. I'll, I'll, I'll wait right here. Okay, I'll be right here. Hold up. Okay, thank you, Coach. Thanks for the uh, Can you sponsor technical difficulties. So maybe you can give us a little summary on uh. What we're experiencing there, and uh, we had a great hour with you. Uh, well, why don't you give us your final thoughts on, you know, what you're going to be doing in the future and how we can move forward in terms of being a little bit more positive? Well, I think, uh, uh, as I mentioned, I'm going to end up with the Discovery Museum. I'm still a trustee at the University of Bridgeport for another few months. The University of Bridgeport is being taken over by Goodwin College, so I'll be done there in May. Uh, back in August, I became uh, chairman of the board of uh, Colby Cathedral High School. So that's going to keep me busy. And I'm also working with the new amphitheater that's being built in Bridgeport, right next to the Webster Bank Arena. So I've got a few things that are keeping me busy. And then once we all get vaccinated and we have to worry about COVID, I'll be back up to Maine to see my grandson. So 